This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israelis offer condolences and lend their hard-fought experiences to Americans after the worst shooting in U.S. history. Plus, the Kurds face stiff opposition after their vote for independence. And the Jewish people in Israel and around the world celebrate Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. In the wake of the Las Vegas massacre, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the people of Israel stand with the people of America, especially at this time. Tragically, Israel has a great deal of experience dealing with terror attacks. CBN News visited a counterterrorism school just outside of Jerusalem and found that Israelis not only mourn with Americans at this time, but also want to share their hard-fought lessons in dealing with terror attacks. Welcome to Caliber 3, a counter-terrorism school training people from all over the world. Am I clear? Sir, yes, sir. Here at Caliber 3, they teach personal self-defense, counter-terrorism techniques, and how to respond during a terror attack. Terror or attacks like that can occur anywhere, in Israel, in Europe, in America, in Las Vegas. Sharon Gad is the founder of Caliber 3, he says Israeli civilians have learned how to quickly respond to a terror attack. They understand immediately after one bullet is shot what they have to do. They have to lie on the ground, catch a cover, get out of the place as, as fast as possible and, and be as small as possible as they can. He also says Israelis have learned from experience that those actions work. Civilians carrying weapons respond to attacks like that and stop them. That's how attacks like these are stopped in Israel. And that way, even if the police is not there and the military is not there, but there was a civilian in the next room in the hotel that had a weapon, he goes and he kills the, the madman and finishes the attack and saves people's lives. He says that during an attack like Las Vegas, people just need to remember to take basic actions. Less exposed, crawl, Find the cover, that'll save your life. He also believes guns in the right hands can save lives. I'm not the guy that is saying that people shouldn't have a weapon. On the contrary, I think people should have a weapon. The weapon is not what kills people. What kills people are people. But you need to know who you're giving the weapon to. And you need to know that the, that the person that is getting a weapon is trained well enough and is mentally uh, mentally okay to carry a weapon. And he thinks that sadly, in light of the Las Vegas massacre, Americans need a new mentality. And Americans have to understand that attacks like this will occur. They occurred and they will occur in the future and people have to be more aware. Mm -hmm. They can still live their life, but they have to be more aware to, to where they're living. The Las Vegas massacre attracted the attention of the world, but there's another important development here in the Middle East. On September 25th last month, the Kurdish people voted overwhelmingly for independence. But instead of celebrating, the U.S. State Department joined other countries in opposing a free and independent Kurdistan. For some observers, it raised the question, is the U.S. punishing one of its best friends in the Middle East? After the referendum, Turkey and Iraq joined forces for a military exercise on the border of Kurdistan. It served as a clear indication of Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's disagreement with the vote. The Kurdistan regional government has in fact thrown itself into the middle of the fire with its senseless attempt at independence. I don't accept anyone's independence. Erdogan also threatened to cut off Kurdistan economically by stopping it from exporting oil and goods to the world. Then in Baghdad, the Iraqi government stopped international airlines from flying into the region's two international airports. That forced the evacuation of a number of NGOs. 
Really sad, yes. I came here to, to try and make a difference to people living in an IDP camp um, and I'm really heartbroken that I can't continue with them. While that isolated the Kurds from much of the world, the U.S. piled on when Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said the U.S. does not recognize the Kurdistan regional government's unilateral referendum. The vote and the results lack legitimacy, and we continue to support a united, federal, democratic, and prosperous Iraq. The Kurds are, are our greatest ally in the region. Retired General Jay Garner says the Kurds earned the right for U.S. recognition. And they fought with us in 2003. They held the line in 2014 when the Iraqi army fled, when the Iraqi army ran. They held the line for over two years without us giving them much equipment, just as light infantry. And they held a thousand kilometers of line against ISIS, and we don't recognize that now. They're our allies, the most pro-U.S. people in this region, and what we're doing now, we're punishing them. He says the U.S. picked the wrong place to push away a close ally. We ought to grab a friend where they can. This part of the world's not very friendly, not very friendly at all. But up here, these guys are real friends, and we ought to wrap our arms around them. Israel is also a friend of the United States in the region. Some would consider it their best friend. They're also pioneers in cyber warfare, where computers become weapons. That's why CBN's Regent University recently opened up a cyber range to train their students in careers in cyber security. CBN founder Pat Robertson spoke with retired Israeli Brigadier General Ron Rosen about Regent University's new program. Hey, listen, what did we buy at, at Regent? Well, what is this uh, thing that is over there now? What will it do? I think it will take care of the operators. You know, it will train operators, better operators. You can't throw, you know, trained soldiers and tell them they're trained if they're not, if they don't feel and don't have friction mm -hmm. uh, in the battlefield. It's a battlefield. You know, if you have PowerPoint slides and read a book, it's not good enough. You can't go to war like that. You don't do that with pilots. You don't do that with Marines. You don't do that with ground forces. You okay. train them. You let them fire. So this training, this range, cyber range, is, uh, is going to make the students much more capable. Mm -hmm. So when they meet their enemy, and it's their enemy, face-to-face, uh, -face, so to speak, they're going to be much better in, you know, in how they deal with it and mitigate the risks that come out of this attack. Uh, is Israel able to overcome the enemies around her? Uh, I imagine Israel is, is so much superior in terms of cyber uh, technology. Am I correct in that? We're working very hard to be superior. <laughs> that's a, it's a hard work because it's, you know, it's like moving on an escalator that's, walk, that's moving down. Uh -huh. You can't be standing. You have to be constantly moving up and not in uh, speed, which is the speed of the stairs moving down. You have to move faster than that. Mm -hmm. So it's a race, it's a constant race, and there's, a, uh, there's actually an a arms race out there. So you have to be very resourceful, and you have to learn very quick. Uh, the learning cycle has to be very quick. Uh, it's not enough to you know, go out of school and, and you think you know everything. It's not, you have to learn every day and debrief yourself and think of where technology is going because the technology is actually the landscape mm -hmm. of this realm. It's a, it's a man-made realm. So when you have a man-made realm, you have technology and you have the flaws in technology and the bad people use the flaws to get into where they shouldn't be. And so it's a race, it's a constant race. Up next, an exclusive look and how Iranian converts to Christianity take a bold step in their newfound faith. I became a Christian after seeing Jesus in a dream. As I was getting baptized this morning, I felt the Holy Spirit come upon me in a new way. This may come as a surprise to most people, but Christianity in Iran is growing faster than any other country in the world, where the population is overwhelmingly Muslim, yet thousands are abandoning Islam. Recently, a group of Iranian Christians were baptized. 
and they invited our reporter, George Thomas, to document the occasion. On a recent Friday, 600 miles east of Tehran, not too far from the Afghanistan-Turkmenistan border, 20 Iranians prepared for a secret journey out of their country. For their safety, we've concealed their identities and changed their names. I've been waiting for this moment for nearly nine years. The mission took months to prepare. It was fraught with danger. This was my wish before I die. Afarin helped arrange their travel. The moment the Iranian government discovers someone has changed their religion, they will try everything to stop the person from sharing their new faith with others. Most of these new Christians paid a price for abandoning Islam. The government scares Christians, imprisons them, fires them from their jobs, kicks them out of school, and many other tactics, all in an effort to stop them from evangelizing. Afarin knew what they were about to experience could land them in trouble. CBN News met them shortly after they left Iran. Due to the sensitive nature of this report, CBN News has agreed not to reveal our location nor the names of the individuals associated with the story. And this is why they left Iran for a few days. For the first time, all 20 followed Christ in baptism. Inside Iran, if the government found out that you were baptized, you would be automatic uh, imprisonment. And so rather than do that inside their country, they came outside for a special event like this. One by one, the young and old got dunked. Men, women and children, all of whom renounced Muhammad and professed their faith in Jesus Christ in a swimming pool rented for the occasion. 53-year-old Fari Bors waited 10 years for this moment. I accepted Christ when I was 43 years old. There was no way for me to get baptized in Iran because of the dangers we face. Today, my faith is complete. 16-year-old Sarah accepted Christ four years ago. I became a Christian after seeing Jesus in a dream. As I was getting baptized this morning, I felt the Holy Spirit come upon me in a new way. Entire families got baptized. It feels very good. I'm very happy. My whole family is happy. And what makes this baptism all the more significant is that the majority of Iranians in attendance have come from the nation's third largest city of Mashhad, which also happens to be one of Shia Islam's most holiest cities. Ilahi, once a devout Muslim, said the Quran left her with more questions than answers. This was the appointed time for me to get baptized. Also, I know God used the past 11 years to grow my faith so I could endure difficult times. Experts say her testimony and that of many others points to evidence that God is advancing his kingdom in Iran. We had never seen such an unprecedented growth of an underground church anywhere else before. Mike Ansari, an Iranian by birth, is director of operations at Mohabbat TV. In 2006, it became the first 24-hour Farsi Christian channel to beam gospel programs into Iran. The majority baptized this weekend came to faith by watching Mohabbat TV. Some of these believers wait, waited for many, many years to be baptized. They want to tell the world that they belong to Jesus. They want to tell the world that what was before is dead, and now they're a new creation. Ansari says many Iranians, especially the young, feel disillusioned with Islam, and record numbers are turning to this channel to learn more about Christianity. Roughly about 16 million Iranians uh, within the last uh, 12 months have viewed one or, one, uh, or more of our programs on, on satellite TV and also on their, uh, on their mobile devices. That roughly uh, translates to about 20% of Iran's population. Uh, and that is an overwhelming number. Mohabbat is now one of four satellite channels broadcasting continuous Christian programming into Iran. Since we didn't know other believers or were part of a house church, there was nobody to help us grow in our faith. We could only grow through watching Mohabbat TV and with the Holy Spirit's help to get stronger in our faith. 
Nathan Rastampour led a house church in Iran for 10 years until he was forced to flee because of religious persecution. Now he hosts a show on Mohabbat TV, teaching folks how to safely run a house church inside Iran. God is using this house church show to, to sh not only share the gospel, but also to equip the house churches and make leaders. And those who track the growth of Christianity around the world say the one place where the faith is growing the most is in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Edward Hovsepian says this is nothing short of a miracle. His brother, Haik Hovsepian, an Assemblies of God pastor, was murdered in Iran for his faith in 1994. He says no matter how hard the government tries, it hasn't been able to stop the spread of Christianity. They are very scared of the Bible, and they realize many Iranians are attracted to Christianity. The government persecutes them, hoping to undo the effect. But the result is the opposite, as more come to faith. After a few days of fellowship, teaching, and encouragement, the 20 believers returned to Iran, energized and committed to sharing the love of Christ with their countrymen. Ansari says these exclusive images should encourage Christians that God is moving on the hearts of Iranians. There is a lot of good news that is coming out of Iran, and we need to focus on that and celebrate that. We are hoping that the results that are being shared with the, with the church in the West would encourage the body of Christ in the Western world that uh, God is very much alive among Muslims and he's doing a great job. George Thomas, CBN News, somewhere in the Middle East. Coming up, Jews around the world celebrate Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and build a temporary shelter. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have followed the biblical injunction to dwell in temporary dwellings during the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot. CBN's Julie Stahl takes us inside one of those sukkahs, and here's how it brings the Jewish people closer to God. Some call him Hashem. It's an ancient biblical commandment that's still being kept today. Some call it a Jewish camping trip, but with the conveniences of home. Shalom. Hi, shalom. Welcome. Shalom. We're so glad thank to have you. you here with us in our sukkah. Yes, thank you. We're here in our sukkah, which is really the, the home away from homes for this whole week of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Like many Israelis and Jewish people around the world, Seth and Teina Ben Chaim build a sukkah or booth on the back porch of their Jerusalem apartment every year. It helps us remember, first of all, we're commanded to remember the exodus from Egypt and how we needed to uh, wander through the desert for 40 years without permanent dwellings. But it also reminds us that even though we've been brought into the land of Israel, we haven't reached our final destination. So tell us about the sukkah itself. What, what do you, how do you make a sukkah? And the main thing is that it's a roof that will uh, make us feel that we're open to the elements. Uh -huh. And then we and need why to... why is that? Well, because otherwise we'd be in the protection of our homes in some ways. And, uh, and we're supposed to be in this flimsy tabernacle uh, so that we can remember that ultimately we're under Hashem's uh, protection. Most sukkahs are decorated at least in part by the children. Families eat, sleep, study, and play together in their temporary houses for a whole week. Despite the camping conditions, it's considered a joyful time. And, and you can focus on the real important things like relationships and, uh, and just sitting down and studying the Word and talking with the, the children about God's faithfulness. Jonathan and his sister Rebecca enjoy the holiday so much, Jonathan made his treehouse into a sukkah. This was Sukkot. This was Sukkot. And that too. That's very pretty. So you decorated your sukkah up here. Yes. Wow. Another part of the Sukkot celebration, recorded in Leviticus 23, is bringing a special fruit and branches to rejoice before the Lord. We offer them to Hashem, all four of these, in our uh, prayers. Every morning we wave them in many different directions and we, uh, we really look to above. And that's what this type of roof helps us remember too, is we're looking to above because that's where our help is going to come from. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. 
Up next, with Ben and Asuka, now see how people prepare and build their own tabernacles when we come back. As we mentioned in the book of Leviticus in the Bible, the Lord commands the Jewish people to build tabernacles or booths and live in them for seven days. CBN News took a trip to the Jerusalem market known as the Shuk to see how people prepare for the feast and then what it takes to put a sukkah together. Take a look at what you can see on our social media channels. <laughs> So I just want to tell you what we're actually doing here. It's in the book of Leviticus, and it says you should take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. These funny-looking lemons are called etrogs or citrons. They're citron fruits and they are edible, but we don't buy them to eat at this time of the year. You want to make sure you get one that doesn't have a blemish in it because it's a special fruit that it speaks about in the book of Leviticus for this holiday. Okay, here we are, and we're gonna build a sukkah. So here we go. We hope you've enjoyed our look at the preparations for the Biblical Feast of Tabernacles. As we mentioned, it's an example of what you can find on our social media channels. For all our Jewish friends, we'd like to say Hak Sameah, Happy Holidays. That's it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can see us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.